uh, I just uh, recall that uh, we have been having such monthly lectures for many, many years, say over 12 years in the Habitat Center uh, by the eminent speakers. Due to COVID, we, of course, having regular lectures, but then uh, today we are fortunate to have Professor Mahesh Tandon, uh, who has agreed to talk on a very important topic, structures for uh, underground metro. Uh, before he starts uh, talking and I hand over the mic to I mean, uh, request the moderator to proceed further, uh, Professor Mahesh Tandon is well known consultant not in the country, but uh, he's an international expert in the field of structural engineers. He graduated in 1962 from Ruti University, now called IIT Ruti. He uh, immediately went for further studies to the United States and uh, did his MS from Republic University, Illinois University, and came back, started working uh, with renowned consultants and uh, now we all know that apart from his uh, uh, consultancy, he's a guest professor even now at IIT Gandhinagar. He was accreditation of international professional engineer under the AICT program, Indian National Academy of Engineering appointed him distinguished visiting professor of IIT at Kanpur, Roorkee, and Gandhinagar during 2005 to 2015. Currently, he is continuing as guest professor in IIT Gandhinagar since 2019. He is the recipient of, of distinguished alumnus award of IIT Roorkee in 2018, and. Uh, Lifetime Achievement Award of Indian Concrete Institute uh, in 2008 and then he, now the Lifetime Achievement Award he got from Indian Road Congress in 2020. He is also Chairman Search Council CSIR CBRI 2020-2023. Before I go, go further, I will uh, be glad to introduce our moderator, a renowned uh, professional person, and at the age of uh, 85 plus, uh, he is in fact uh, the inspiration to the all young engineers. Uh, Dr. Prem Krishna joined the faculty of the civil engineering at the University of Rutki in 1965. Before that, he graduated in 1959 from Rutgers University and then went further to Imperial College London, where at the age of 27, he completed his doctorate. And then since 1998, he continuously worked in the University of Rutki, now IIT Rutki as professor and has been associated with research, teaching, and consultancy work. He, however, maintained contact with the institution of adjunct positions till 2007. Professor Prem Krishna also had teaching assignments at the University of Illinois, Urbana, United States during 68-69, and the Imperial College London, uh, UK during 69-70. In addition to his academic work, he has been keenly active in research and development and maintained close interaction with industry in the area of steel structures, long spans, structures, and wind engineering. Uh, regarding the today's topic, 
about the structures for underground metro. The most dramatic development in the field of urban infrastructure in the recent times has undoubtedly been the introduction of the metro as a transport system, apart from providing the predominant mode of travel. The metro has been instrumental in reducing pollution and making a significant contribution to the improvement of quality of life of the citizens. For the engineering community, metro projects afford great opportunities to develop the skills and to seek innovative solutions to the difficult problems which are peculiar to large scale infection in the urban environment. An efficient MRTS requires an integration of many engineering disciplines. The object of the presentation is to highlight how structural engineering and geotechnical engineering are applied for the construction of underground structures for metros. The main components of the underground metro system include the structures along the alignment interconnected by tunnels. And now I request uh, Professor Prem Krishna to proceed further. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dhawan. There is a small technical glitch. I think Professor Prem Krishna uh, is, I, oh, he got reconnected. Oh, great. Very good. Absolutely timely, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Professor Prem Krishnaji. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Davan Saab, for your kind introduction. Uh, <clears throat> let me join him in uh, welcoming all the participants to this lecture this evening on underground metro structures by Professor Tandon. Uh, <clears throat> besides all the uh, Oh. oh, I think he lost his connection once again. Meanwhile, uh, Tandon Saab, I think if you can uh, sh start sharing your presentation, I think Professor Prem Krishna Ji will join back. Okay. Just tell me when it comes. Has anything come on the screen? Yeah, yeah, it has come. Uh, Kindly put it in the yeah. uh, presentation mode. Hmm. Let me see how to do that. Yes. Ah, yes, it has come. Okay, so, so whenever maybe... Professor Prem Krishna comes, we can request him to continue his introductory remarks. I think ah, he, he has is. joined, he has joined, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Professor Tandon uh, is going to talk to us, as I said, about structures for underground metro. And uh, he has been involved in this field of engineering for many, many years. And uh, it is needless for me to say that metros are always in busy cities. They go through busy cities, either overground or underground. And we are aware that in any case, there are so many complex problems that have to be faced in uh, uh, constructing a metro. And even more so if you go underground, so then you've got to take care of a few additional issues. So therefore, at the best of times, the design and construction of structures for the metro is a very complex affair. And I'm sure he, uh, with all the great experience that he has in this field, will be sharing all those with us. So I'll not uh, stand between you and him uh, longer and request Professor Dundon to kindly deliver his lecture. As he goes along, uh, I'm sure you will have uh, maybe clarifications to seek or questions to ask or comments to make. Uh, put them in the question and answer box so that at the end of the talk, we can look at those 
uh, uh, those questions uh, or comments in the question and answer box and uh, we can request Professor Tandon to address those. So over to you, Professor Tandon, before I get disconnected again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank okay. you, Professor Prem Krishna, for the wonderful introduction. And it's a privilege to uh, speak where you are the moderator. Um, and uh, of course, it is uh, my privilege also to welcome Mr. Dhawan. Dr. Dhawan has uh, been the, in the forefront of doing this monthly lectures for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that in IES Shakti. And the only thing now is that instead of having it physically, we are going online. And uh, finally, Mr. Alok Bhavik, who is the prime mover of uh, all the uh, activities which are to do with presentations, conferences, webinars, you name it. The person who is the motivator and uh, who is the uh, driving force behind all this is Mr. Alok Bhamik. So welcome to him also. And I would like to welcome all the participants who have taken time out. I hope after a cup of tea, I've got mine right beside me. So I hope that you have some, made some similar arrangements. So structures for underground metro, that is the subject. And I will start with slide number one or two, whatever it is. Okay, firstly, the construction technologies to be adopted are project specific. There is no real formulation of, uh, you know, how to proceed because they lot depend on the characteristics of the substrata, which is obvious, you are going underground, and the existing built environment. These uh, metro cons uh, uh, constructions are required in the urban areas. They are not required in, you know, uh, traveling from one city to another. That is not metro. That is something else. But within the city, uh, you have to travel. And one of the most sustainable uh, forms of transport, which has been uh, universally agreed, is the metro, because it has the least impact on the built environment. The construction should be obviously safe, efficient, economical, and environment friendly. Underground met structures <coughs> for metro require skill sets, skill sets of both structural engineering and geotechnical engineering. The team must also consist of architects and uh, MEP specialists, that is mechanical, electrical, plumbing, which everybody knows. Mechanical is basically the, the ventilation because you are underground and there is no fresh air there unless you bring it. And there are things like um, fire uh, 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 protection, which is a part of the mechanical part of mechanical side of MEP. Here is an example of the recently completed uh, metro in Lucknow. And I wanted to particularly show this to you because Lucknow is a place where I did a lot of education. And Hazrat Ganj is the famous main street where everything of importance is situated. What you see here, I hope you can see my um, cursor. This is the divisional uh, uh, office of the Northern Railway in Lucknow. So that's a, another a very important landmark. And right in front of it, we are making the metal, as you can see. So in this case, what you are seeing in the slide, there is metro box, as we call it, is actually being constructed, has to is being constructed in two stages. That means half of it you have excavated, while the other half is available for the traffic to move. So this is how we normally do it. You cannot stop the traffic. You cannot always divert it. So 
you another situation is that you take part of the road and uh, 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 construct it part of the road and the other part you uh, construct the, that is, as you can see in this slide of course even in the in doing this you you can see how the cars are moving like this and then they are going on the other side of the road so you got a uh, excavation here and you got another excavation going on there so all these i would say circus like uh, acts have to form a part of the planning process here you can see um, very close to udyog bhavan i mean one of the uh, very famous uh, government buildings right next to it you have to go down about 25 meters or so and how it is done you can see here you can see these little toy trains these are not toy trains but since we are the picture is taken from far off they look like toy trains but actually what they are doing is to take the muck out of the tunnel the tunnel is where this open area which you see excavated where that ends that's where the tunnel starts from so you make the tunnel and then you have to see how to uh, take the muck out and then finally dispose it off now what happens is that to start with you must understand that there is a lot of force that is required to make a tunnel if you have a tunnel boring machine it of course has to have a lot of torque so that it revolves with a cutter head and there is also some uh, jacking done behind it so that it you you get a, a pressure and you also rotate the cutter head so that is the way in which the uh, tunnel boring machine works and uh, to start with as you can see you the, the uh, may have a force of something like 20000 tons that is required i mean your 2000 tons which is required to get the be moving and that is called the initial drive i will just show you what it looks like of course you can see here the, the small tunnel boring machine it's only about 10 meters in length so let's go further first thing is about the uh fixing the alignment and the uh, that is the most uh, crucial part of the whole project and after the alignment has been fixed you have to fix where you want the stations so this shows you a what we call a block diagram of the up line which is at the top and the down line which is at the bottom as to what all is happening here uh it has to show where the stations are it has to show some kind of a program like this one at the bottom you can see all the dates as to when you start and uh, which way uh, and when you finish and when you reach the key milestone which is at each station so what you see in uh, here these are the uh two tunnel boring machines for the up and down line and of course you have the stations which are shown uh, in this case it starts with varli and then goes to uh siddhi vinayak then goes to dadar then sitla devi then naya nagar and dharavi this is basically the project uh, you must cover the entire thing and normally it's about 5 odd kilometers which make one contract uh in the underground portion because the cost is quite high it may be something like 250 uh, 2 lakh 50000 uh, rupees per meter so the the cost normally become quite huge so if you have got something like 10000 uh, crores worth of a project it's a it's it's a, 
quite large even for a single pro project but about 5 kilometers is the typical length of an underground contract uh, what you see here by arrows is that first you have to decide the, or the contractor has to decide as to how he is going to do the tunneling you cannot have tunneling uh, machines uh, which are too many in number you have to optimize them and yet you have to meet all the time schedules and the um, and the key dates which are uh, in between so to do that they first have to plan like this that i let us say my tbm3 which is one uh, tbm the first drive will be here then uh, this will be the third drive so second drive will be somewhere here you see the by the arrow it's going like this and it's going like this so it's a uh, all this he has to plan out first so that you know when how many machines to to get and which way they will be moving and how you are going to achieve the key dates of the contract another thing that you have to plan, uh, plan for is the trees because everything that you see in a in a uh, uh, in the alignment the tunnel of course is under the uh, it's uh, below the ground level so that is not a problem but as far as the and it does not require any opening except at the beginning and at the end but if you see the uh, the station the station cannot have something which is over it it has to be removed at one stage or the other even if you do it in two two stages you have to remove everything and one of the major issues is the trees which are coming in the way and you have to uh, make sure that you can take out a tree and this is an example which you see on the upper uh, photograph how the tree has to be transplanted you can see the crane behind and that crane will lift up this and put it in a designated place which is uh, arranged beforehand the other thing is that you come across enormous utilities sometimes the utilities may be as large as this what you are seeing on the lower uh, picture so you have many choices what to do about these utilities should we remove them should we divert them or should we support them as you can see here and make it and don't uh, really uh, uh, and make it operational all the time so this as you can see is the main water supply line which feeds the part of the bombay city and you cannot shut this off so you have to make arrangements as to how to support it and then of course it will be buried uh, under the ground at the same level we are not changing anything this is the best way if you can manage now looking at an artistic impression of an underground station as you can see there is a train so obviously this is called the platform level and then there can be one or two floors above these are called called concourse levels there are of course escalators and staircases and lifts which go up and down so that you can go uh, right from the uh, top to the bottom you can travel without difficulty you can also see on the side this is called the back of the house areas where all the technical rooms etc are uh, situated for example if you have a ventilation to be done it starts from here the all the ventilation equipment will be here if you want transformers for power they will be all located here so there is quite a lot of space which is occupied by the back of the house um, part of the station 
one second. Uh, uh. Now let us talk about the tunneling by the tunnel boring machine, how it is done. This is the finished product that you can see. Uh, you can see the tracks in one um, tunnel, we normally have only one track. That is the current situation as far as the metros in India are concerned. This is about 5.8 meters in diameter internal. And there are two such tunnels which will be there running side by side as you saw in the first uh, slide itself. And of course, there are a lot of things which are moving with it, in it. More interestingly, what I wanted to show you was these precast panels. And these precast panels are connected together. You can see this, um, this hole here in the precast panel. And there will be a bolt which goes from here to here. So it's a it's a it's a it's a bolt which is actually bent so that they can be joined together. And these are all uh, rings, we call them. Each ring is about 1.25 meters or so. And the thickness of these lining is about 250 millimeter. So uh, how is this constructed? This is uh, your precast panels, as you can see that we call it the tunnel lining, which is in concrete. That is being... Uh, it is uh, being uh, precast and of course it is being moved here and there by this uh, um, gantry, overhead gantry that you see. The capacity of which is 15 tons, which is quite adequate to move, you know, one segment at a time. So this one, for example, it shows you another uh, of the same thing. You have all the, the joints have to be staggered. Of course, the ring has to be only one. But the joints have to be staggered so that you don't get the weakness at one point only. So, um, as you can see here, there are a lot of things which are inside. Basically, they are all to make sure that you can connect with neighboring segments. Now, this is the tunnel boring machine, what it looks like. I talked about a cutter head, which uh, rotates. And uh, you have to put pressure. And you can see behind it, there are hydraulic jacks, which actually push the cutter. And it also, the cutter also rotates. So that's the way the progress is made by the, uh, the TBM to go forward. Of course, there are other things like you can see here. Uh, this is the tunnel lining segment, which are precast. And you bring it here, and the tunnel boring machines, which are now coming, have the facility of doing everything. That means they are positioning the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the precast segments in uh, in rings, as you can see here, and they are also moving forward with it. So I hope that this uh, thing will work. But anyway, this is showing you another one. The diameters can vary, and people have now reached about 15 meters in diameter in in metro uh, constructions. Uh, the in India, at the moment, we are using about 5.8 meter and using two different tunnels for the up and down line. Here you can see, it is the right side, a lot of things are being done.
So all the earth is removed also has to be, as you can see from that little space behind the cutter head, it is being extracted. Okay. Now, uh, at some point or the other, you have a launching shaft. As a matter of fact, wherever you start the tunnel boring machine from, and you have to launch it, it has to have some openings so that you can lower this tunnel boring machine and then it starts functioning. Here you can see the tunnel boring machine being lowered. And finally on the, or in this photograph, you can see the tunnel boring machine in position. And this is the, called the uh, initial, uh, initial part of the uh, tunnel boring machine. The tunnel boring machine may be as long as 50 meters uh, with all its uh, paraphernalia and all that. But the front part, which moves first, uh, that is only 10 meters long, as you can see here. So here, the you have to put the first part, which is the front part, which is being has to be lowered first. And you can see all the photographs, how gradually it is lowered down into position. Connection between the station and the tunnel, what you can see here. Uh, this is where the finally the uh, tunnel starts or ends. And on this side, you have the station. It has to um, be planned properly as to how this tunnel boring machine is going to come out, where it is going to come out. And what should be the distance between the center lines of the tunnel? Normally, the minimum distance between the, or clear distance, I'll say, between the uh, tunnels has to be at least equal to the tunnel diameter. That's the thumb rule which we adopt. And also, it must have, before you reach the ground level, this, of course, is the, 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 the slab, so this is not the ground, but from here it has to be six meters minimum uh, below ground. So you must have a earth cover of at least this much. Okay, so let's see what happens to this. Uh, the tunnel, not no, tunnel initially, of course, a circle. But with all the pressures of the top, like it is at least 6 meters below, sometimes it can be 20 meters below the ground. So you have a lot of pressure which is coming from the top, which is trying to overlies it. But you also have the horizontal forces which are applied to the tunnel. So the two are acting together. Uh, and finally, you get an oval shaped uh, normally because the vertical uh, vertical uh, pressures are always more than the horizontal pressures. But the secret of all this is that the lining should be kept in compression. All the parts. That is the best way to design a lining of the tunnel so that there is at no time you can get any opening of the joints of the um, of the uh, lining much like precast segmental construction we never allow any tension to take place well here the situation is a little different in the sense that the all the there are a lot of joints in the 
circumferential and longitudinal direction and they can never be as good as the uh, you know a, a monolithic kind of a ring so, because that is not what you are making you are making the ring out of uh, segments now what happens is that the moment there is a displacement as you can see the top of this circle has actually reached here the moment that happens there is an immediate effect on the at the ground level the as it is being over taking an oval shape the ground is also settling here and uh if there are, for example any buildings close by or if there is a building on top and you cannot take the, the you can take the um, the uh, tunnel boring machine under the building but provided you take care of all these settlements so this is uh, one of the biggest challenges that you have so where should we put the alignment should we put it under the buildings at all no you should try and follow the road the road has got nothing in it but unfortunately all roads are not absolutely straight they are got curves and all that so the tunnel boring machine has to negotiate that alignment that you have to you have fixed and we try to keep to the road as far as possible unless you have some green field area and you can go there and there is no built uh, structures either above it or very close to it then of course it's a different issue uh, so if you you know that it is going to overlies what are the forces that you are going to get you are of course going to get the bending moment and shear and of course you are going to have a direct force this is a typical segment which we have taken out uh, from this whole circle which is consists a consist of seven or eight segments when you are doing Uh, of this diameter but when the diameter keeps on increasing you also keep increasing the number of segments so that they are easy to handle i think this is not very easy to see okay uh, okay uh, let me just try to tell you there is the uh, aims on one side and there is the trauma center on the other side and the question is if it takes from one hospital to the other you should be able to transport patients very quickly so uh, the medical authorities asked dmrc to make this tunnel which connects the two hospitals but the problem was this is the aurobindo mark so it is across the aurobindo mark that you have to make a tunnel but the uh, the, the aurobindo mark already has a a metro running underground so you have to have over the existing metro a, a passage created and i told you the you must have 6 meters clear distance that is in the normal case but when we are faced with this kind of a situation there may not be 6 meters available so some special designs etc have to be done to make sure that this is going to be possible so here you can see the existing uh, tunnels Uh, which is a running uh, metro uh, tunnel the thick the metros are moving here and there and you are crossing above it that's the situation here you can see that what did we do here since that thing was not available uh, the cover and all here the existing one had the cover uh, uh, but you have to make a uh, connection between the two hospitals at this level because it has to be underground 
and it has to have some clear height, etc. So by the time you finish all this, you are coming very close to the tunnel. So these are some walls which have been constructed, and I'll tell you how these are made. But normally these are diaphragm walls, which we'll just see how they are constructed. And uh, so you can you you'll be moving at this level in the as far as the traffic between the two hospitals are concerned. Um, you also, uh, you can see here another very interesting uh, issue. When you are making a tunnel like that, it has to be done in cover. That means that it has to be excavated from the top. But when you when you excavate from the top, at some stage or the other, you will require a support. And this, you are, of course, going to connect it with a disk slab, which is very good. Uh, sorry, the, the, the base slab, which is very good. So, but between the top slab and the bottom slab, there is too much of distance. And any kind of walling system that you have here may not work. So you have a temporary bracing, which is uh, goes by the name of uh, strut. And this is a whaler which runs longitudinal to the uh, uh, to, uh, to the tunnel, or, or rather to the passage. I'll call it. So, with the whaler and strut, you have been able to provide temporary support at this level. This is how it is uh, made possible that even when you don't have six meters uh, of earth cushion everywhere, you can find out some means of doing it. And here you can see the traffic is moving at the ground level. You can't disturb this traffic incidentally on Aurobindo Mark. Without disturbing the traffic, you have to make this. Of course, while you are doing the uh, cut and cover message, there it will be disturbed, but that also has to be done in stages. So, so that the traffic is never stopped. It is constricted to travel in a, a, a limited amount of width. Yes. Okay. So let's see about the underground station. So this is what a typical underground station looks like. At the end, of course, like I told you, you saw the from the inside of the station. These are the um, tunnels, always two in number, the up and down line, diameter 5.7 in this case. And uh, what you are seeing here is the perimeter wall, which is the most important part of the station. How to make this per perimeter wall? Uh, and there are two ways of constructing it, either top down or bottom up. Uh, top down means that you construct the, uh, the the roof first, and then you go down and take out the earth below that, and reach the next level. Then you cast that, and then connected to the to the, to the walls so that it's, as you keep on going down you keep on making the slabs which are required and there are at least minimum three slabs that you have to make so you you do that and then as you can see there are a lot of entries because there is no use having a station which where you can't enter so the entry has to be from the main road there are also things like, um, you know, uh, um, sorry. I mean, buildings like this, which are utility buildings, which are also required in order to be able to do it, apart from the back of the house, which you've already seen. And just to make things clear, we make the tunnels or tunnel correct connections after the station is already made. 
I mean, you can start the tunnel, but you must have something ready where the tunnel body machine can end and it can be taken out. That is important to know that the tunnels can't be made beforehand. It can, the connection at least has to be done where you get a shaft or a compartment where the tunnel boring machine can come. And uh, length, typical length of such a station is about 250 to 320 meters from here to here. So it's a very big uh, excavation that you have to do in the in the on the road itself, or wherever if it is off side off the road, then it must be something where there is no problem of making such a big excavation width 22 to 30 meters. That means this width and depth of the station can be 20 to 35 meters. So this huge amount of earth that is taken out from here must be disposed of. And those things are done at the planning stage itself as to where it is going to be disposed of. In the decking, and as you saw in the first few slides in Lucknow, for example, I showed you how in one part the traffic was moving on one side and then it was moving on the other side in some other uh, part. So it's basically, if you want to construct here, traffic, which is uh, actually occupying the whole road, has to be restricted to whatever this width you can get. In this case, for example, we've got 11 meters. And this is the portion which is left for you to dig that huge uh, excavation. But after that, uh, what you do is to make a uh, what is called a, a digging because the traffic, this traffic will finally have to be moved here. So what will it move on? Here you want to construct. So below the decking, you can excavate. There has to be a decking which uh, on which traffic move and it is designed accordingly. So when uh, this part has gone down and you put a decking and shift your your traffic on the other side on the this side right side instead of the left side finally you may have to even give one lane here on the right hand extreme which you can see so all this circus activities or chessboard has to be played in order to make sure that the traffic can move you cannot stop the traffic Okay, this is uh, another interesting uh, sketch which shows you that trains are moving at two different levels. This is particularly useful when you are have when you have an interchange stations. You have um, metros coming from one side, and then. Instead of going straight, of course, you have to make provision for that. But it also, on the same station, you have to move left or right. So how to do that is the most convenient way of doing it is that you make a double-decker kind of a situation. And this, what is at the top, this move in after leaving the station, it can move in some direction while the bottom one can move in some other direction. This is what is called an interchange station where you have uh, more than one line meeting and uh, it is an expensive proposition and so we don't have uh, the, uh, interchange stations, very many of them, but some of them are required during in, in the whole network. So this is how they most convenient way of doing it because you cannot make the station too wide. If you are saying that this is the width of the road, 
then you should stick to that. As a matter of fact, in some of the new uh, projects, they have even got, um, you know, three levels of four levels, but not of the, where the train can move. Trains can move in two levels, but the other, so that you don't occupy too much of the road width, they are made much smaller in width. All this has to be uh, planned well in advance uh, after you fix the alignment. The other interesting thing is that when you have something like 300 meters long, uh, long uh, station, you have to do subsurface investigations and all the boreholes may not give you the same type of strata and they won't. So what you have to do is to there, what is the SPT value? What is the type of soil? And any other things that you can uh, think of. So here, for example, you see that there are three boreholes which have been shown uh, because they are on the right side where they were done and uh, uh, which gives you quite different strata between them. And of course, when you compare the strata on this side and this side, it may be different totally. So um, once you do this ready reckoner kind of thing, it it is much easier to design or for the geotechnical and structure combined when you do, this becomes very, very useful. This is another uh, example where you have the um, type of strata, the SPT values we invariably give because a lot of formulations in geotechnical are based really on SPTs. So the minimum minimum uh, the slabs that you require are three in number. It must have a roof, and this roof may be several meters below the ground. Normally, five six meters is the minimum. Uh, it has what is called the concourse and it has uh, the platform level. As you can see, this is a platform and the trains are moving on both sides. This is very useful, what we call the island platform, so that the common uh, things like, for example, a big grand staircase that we have invariably, that can be put uh, in between so that, so that you don't occupy uh, too much space. Similarly, the, the uh, escalators, the lifts, they can be put in the common areas between the two uh, in the platform at the platform level. So that is why this has become the most popular way in which uh, metro's stations are designed. That means that it always has a island platform. So here you you can see that there are more than uh, one level of uh, trains, and you have more. Uh, I mean, more slabs than uh, what you encountered earlier. So minimum is three one, but you can have many more. Now the perimeter wall, which you saw in the slide as to how to make that because without that you can't excavate. So what are the functions of this perimeter wall? Earth retention on the outside and exclusion of groundwater. This, the water cannot enter the station. So these are the two main functions of the perimeter wall. And inside, of course, you can construct, like any other building, all the facilities that you require. But the perimeter wall is something special. I am showing you two types of perimeter walls, which are or peripheral wall, as it is called, which are most commonly used. One is called the diaphragm wall. And you can see here, make, uh, this is the grab, what we call. It is excavated 
And this normally is about five meters in the width of the diaphragm uh, tunnel. And it goes right down to the wherever the base level is, wherever or even beyond the base, wherever you want the diaphragm wall to end. Now, this is done before you can construct the station. So, um, this is the grab which is taking out the earth. And it, uh, normally, it comes with a crane, etc. Uh, this is another one which is lowering down the reinforcement, aid, which you can see here. Of course, to retain the uh, sides of the wall, you also have. Uh, some kind of uh, liquid uh, which can retain the earth. Um, so, another interesting thing to watch is that we are really making alternate panels and the, the remaining panels are constructed after that. Why we do that is that at, these, at this point, you may have to make a water tight connection between the two walls, you cannot have a vertical joint which is um, from where water can leak through. So there is a water stop that has to go through it. So water stop you can put, for example, if you are making, if this is made first, it will have a water stop poking out from here and here. And then you will construct this. That is why the alternate tunnels uh, are the best way to go about it. Here you see what is called the secant pile. And there is also something called a contiguous pile. The piles can be separated, which make the wall. Instead of a diaphragm wall, you can have a secant pile wall. It can, uh, you can put closely spaced uh, piles. You can make them contiguous. That means that there is hardly any space left. Or you can have the secret pile as is normally being done, which is even from here, water can leak through as you will appreciate. But if you have a, uh, a pile like this, now how? what is this we are trying to say? What you see is, is a soft pile. So first we make the soft piles. And then there is a hard pile, which is made by a piling equipment, which is capable of, of uh, uh, being the soft pile and also have reinforcement in it. The soft pile normally has no reinforcement. And it is M10 or M15, very soft, uh, uh, very soft concrete. So that when you try to uh, make the hard pile, it can easily cut through this. So this makes a chain of, you know, the hard, soft, hard like this all over the periphery. And this can uh, make things very easy. And it is particularly useful. When you are meeting rock, to make a diaphragm wall of, let us say, a panel of five meters in rock, it is like trying to sink a well in rocky strata. When in bridge, bridges, when we have well foundations, you never try to use a well foundation when there you meet with rock. So similar is the case here. It is much easier to make piles and to make panels when you meet rock. So this per the, uh, the second pile alternative is particularly helpful in the case of uh, when you meet rock. As I had explained to you, the, the, we have a water stop which is connecting the various panels. So, if you have a, let us say, already cast panel on both sides, then you make this. It is much easier because this can happen. You can put the uh, 
uh, water stop on the panel which you cast first and it is poking out and then you cast the uh, diaphragm wall next uh, adjacent panel. So this is the best way to go about it. It's normally a 300 millimeter wide water stop. This shows you the sequence of uh, wall panel execution. That means alternate ones first. Also, if you recall, I had mentioned that you require a lot of entries, exits, etc. Now, they, people have to go out of the station and the only way is to make these type of openings in the diaphragm wall. So these have to be planned earlier uh, so that you don't construct and later on try to cut through this. There are ways in which you can plan your the execution of the diaphragm walls in such a manner that there is nothing to be cut later on. Here you can see uh, another the, the 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 reinforcement cage being put into position. It is let us say four or five meters wide. The full length of the um, of the uh, height of the wall. The the normally the reinforcement runs through like that, and it is being lowered into position. Now the question is that how do you there are various stages of construction, which I explained that you make the, let us say, the, the ground level slab first, then you go to the first level, then you go to the next level. Sometimes you may require a strut uh, to stabilize the wall. How is that done and how are the calculations done? These are some special purpose softwares where you um, which can plot for you after you have given the properties of all the soil strata it is giving you how the bending moments and shear forces and displacements how they vary because let us say if you on the right hand side if i excavate some amount of uh, material Obviously, it is not as safe as what you see here, which is just a one-dimensional uh, wall and uh, it's got uh, uh, soil pressures from both sides. So this is perfectly stable. But if you start excavating on one side only, which is what we have to do when you are making this huge pit in the middle of the road or wherever, then if it is going to be done in stages, it is not going to be supported like this. In this case, on the right hand side is always plotted the uh, bending moment and shear force. The bending moment is given at the top and the shear force is given at the bottom. And this gives you the displacement. At the moment, there is no displacement in the wall anywhere throughout the height. Let us take the first there, there may be some um, uh, overburden pressure or surcharge on one side of the panel. Then, because of that, you can see the displacement here in the top. It may be very little, but it's there. As you go deeper or you go um, um, you put more surcharge, you see, if you keep note of at least the displacements, you will be able to see how the thing is varying. And of course, the bending moments and shear forces are also changing every time. Now, this, for example, is a, the roof slab, which has come here. And the roof slab and wall, they are normally monolithic, which means that you are going to get a bending moment as well as a direct force here. So it's uh, that is taken account of, and that is the reason why you see, for example, a break in the bending moment diagram. So this way we keep going down, and the 
uh, grillage is the most convenient way in which to model it, but you can do it by finite element modeling all the slabs uh, and the side walls. So this is how it looks like. The loading that you have to design for are, are just shown here. It, for example, if, you're, you, if you have the groundwater table somewhere here, you are going to get an uplift. And this water pressure at any level is assumed always to be constant. So this is the water pressure. You got the dead load of the hull or the main structure of the station. And you have internal dead loads, superimposed dead loads, live loads, etc. inside. On the sides, you have earth pressure and water pressure, both. So as you are uh, going down, you have to check every stage, let, just like we do in segmental construction or stage-wise construction of a bridge. In this also, you have to do stage-wise analysis. Another important issue is that the groundwater table, uh, whatever is uh, there to, to start with, this groundwater table uh, if you lower it down, it can affect the, 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 the stability of the buildings or the support of the buildings on soil which are in the neighborhood. So there is always a limit as to how much you can lower the groundwater table from whatever it was originally. Of course, when you are constructing inside this uh, huge uh, excavation, you have to have no water inside. But that water, when you uh, remove, uh, it must come, uh, must not go too far. And normally we have two meters as a limit from the uh, limit of whatever the groundwater was there earlier to whatever the groundwater table is permitted to come down to. Everybody knows that you have to have no water here, but then it should go like that, something like this, so that the neighboring buildings are not affected by your dewatering. Now, another important issue is that supposing this is my diaphragm wall or secant pile wall and there is no wall which is infinitely rigid. It, it will deflect as is shown here. Deflected shape would be like this. It may be very small, the deflection, but it is still there. And this gap that is created from the original soil phase to the deflected shape, this volume of soil actually is it has to go somewhere. The question is, what to do with this? So what happens is that if you if this deflects, there are settlements here because all the soil will try and rush in and be in contact with the uh, wall. So as a matter of fact, this is what, let us say it is 25 millimeter. Um, here it is zero, and you have to travel, let us say, some 35 meters before it becomes no effect. So any building that is created, that is existing beyond 30 meters in this case, there is no issue. You don't have to worry about their stability. If there is any building which is closer than 30 meters, then you know that it is going to have some settlement. And it may be unequal settlement. So those, that is what you have to check the existing buildings for, which is an, uh, a part of the calculations and part of the design that you do. That means that the safety of the buildings in the neighborhood of whatever you are excavating, this huge pit, 300 meters long, 25 meters wide, 30 meters deep, when you are doing, you have to make sure that it does not affect the buildings which are close by. 
there are some um, uh, uh, typical formulae as to find uh, find out uh, how to what is the s max that means the maximum settlement which will become very close to the diaphragm wall or the wall panel that you have here <coughs> here you have the maximum deflection <coughs> excuse me this, <coughs> this pink uh, plot that you see it is the trigger value so you will put a lot of instrumentation on the buildings around to make sure that you get advance warning and you stop excavation for example or anything that you have to do to prevent further settlement so there is always a trigger value which we keep as something like 50% to two third of the uh, settlement so the if you are expecting this settlement these are all theoretically done we are not actually measuring the settlement but when you are excavating you are measuring the settlement so the pink value that you see line that is the trigger value which you have to fix that there should be some alarms and this is has to be done 24 by 7 we have a monitoring system to make sure that no building is being uh, affected by this excavation so this is a typical station <clears throat> and these are buildings which are all around and when we excavate which which is of the shape of the building itself uh we plot contours these are contours as to how much settlement will happen obviously like we saw in the uh, in the in the chart before that if you go 30 meters uh, away from the building that those buildings are safe but some buildings which are closer they are not safe i mean you have to check that they will be safe with whatever settlement that you have so the settlements that <coughs> are indicated uh 6 mm 8 10 20 these are the contours which you have made here there are of course softwares available <coughs> which tell you that if you do this excavation here what is going to be the settlement and how to draw this settlement contour so b1 is the safest part that means that what you see somewhere here this is 6 mm so if you got beyond that we are saying it is safe so these are all empirical things you know we we have to fix that earlier real time monitoring i mentioned this is how we do it we have some targets which are fixed this is an existing building <coughs> oh <coughs> excuse me so these are so, so respective so of what else we do but visual uh, monitoring is very important so at some point in the existing building you have to fix targets so keep measuring that target and seeing whether it's going down how much it is gone down etc <clears throat> now there are some very difficult kind of situations which we have encountered during the course of constructing station buildings <clears throat> on the left hand side you can see how close you come to an existing building this is this may be going down meters 30 meters deep here is another building 
where there are multiple levels of slabs, which you can see here. <clears throat> this is a secant pile uh, with uh, whalers and rock anchors. I think we have not talked about rock anchors, but these whalers, these are the secant piles, the soft and hard piles. And <clears throat> this is the uh, tunnel boarding machine, which is about to enter. And you have <clears throat> um, whalers are extremely important because if you have want to put rock anchors, which is to stabilize the wall, then you can see here, at the top, you have the secant pile. <clears throat> and if this is the rock level, which we are talking about, then there you may or may not require anything to support. But you can put, in this case, rock anchors, and the more version of that is called soil nailing, which you put here. Of course, the rock anchors have to go very deep uh, and they have to, they may start from something which is in the soft soil. Because the Professor, rock Tundan. Level... Professor Tundan, yeah. do, you, do you want to take a couple of minutes and have some water? You know, your... oh, oh. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. This is the, the COVID still at work. I got yeah. it in June and my throat is still like this. Okay, let's try. I think that helped. Thank you, Professor Prem Krishna. So, as you can see here, the whalers are very important because these Soil anchors, this is in the longitudinal sense, that is perpendicular to the screen, you have to put several um, rock anchors. And the rock anchors means that it must go below the rock level. So this is the safest way of doing it. <clears throat> you are, for example, this is a rock face. Everything is not a solid, massive rock. You can have rock, which are, um, which have got fissures and uh, so on. In those cases, you may have to put these soil nailings and we put actually a wire mesh and ignite it, then we put the soil nailing. This is a cheaper way of stabilizing when you get rock. But at the top, uh, you have to have which is the soft soil, you have to put soil anchors like this. Now, these soil anchors may go below the buildings which are already existing. So, one of the conditions of the contract is always that you have to remove this soil anchor if it is going beyond the right of way of the, uh, of the metro. Then you have to remove it. So, there are special retractable anchors which are available for the purpose. Another uh, important uh, way of doing these stations, which is now becoming more and more popular, like if you are making something in Chandni Chalk, you don't have the luxury of making a big wide uh, uh, station the, of the size that we have been talking about. You may be able to do only very narrow kind of a station as is shown here, and you can make it long but not wide because this, the, the roads themselves may be only 10 meters wide. Out of that also you are taking away some part, at least. So there is something called the nailing method, which is NATM, New Austrian Tunneling Method. This technique is slightly different from the tunnel boring machine. The tunnel boring machine can't go here. So what they do is that in the middle, they have all the facilities and, of course, the uh, facility to go up and down. And 
on the two sides or sometimes only on one side like in this one it is on both sides you have a platform and you have the possibility of the train traveling that's all the space that you require you don't require anything else no space for going up and down and all that which you that grand staircase that you have in the middle of every station the, those type of things are not necessary all those can be situated here so uh, this is the other way in which uh, the underground metros are being constructed of course this technique is more difficult this natum and uh, okay let's go some other kind of thing now in rock anchors you have to test every single rock when you and these are pre stressed normally so you have to make sure that the bond between the uh, grout that you have done and the strands which are inside very much like the strands we use in bridges that that is going inside and so it's a you have the whaler here so the testing of the anchors is exceedingly important because they have to last at least temporarily this wall that you see here second pile wall it does not form a part of the permanent structure and this is what is called the bottom up construction that means that you made a uh, a, a big excavation and then you are constructing from the bottom you have already seen that you can go from the top down and you can also go from bottom up this has the advantage that it can be made more waterproof you can have a membrane waterproofing system which is going all around and as a matter of fact if you see the middle east which people have got a little more money than we have uh, they don't allow uh, the diaphragm wall or second pile wall to be made a part of the permanent structure so you have to perforce do a bottom up construction so in 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 india that is not the case we we do both bottom up and uh, top down in india we also do bottoms up if you know what i mean when you are having a drink but let's come back to i think engineering <laughs> okay these rock anchor machines are quite handy as you can see here this is the machine which drills the hole which may be 150 mm in diameter and uh, this is the anchor very much like what you see in uh, bridge construction uh, just to check professor prem krishna how much time do i have this time do you think you have to wind up or conclude um 10 minutes yeah great okay sure <clears throat> so this is uh, the way in which it is done uh this is another picture where you have a uh, you know a second pile wall which you can see the hard pile and the soft pile here also you can put rock anchors the rock anchors the the anchor itself goes through the soft pile but it you have the whaler which is in touch with all the hard pile this way you can it's very easy to do even a stabilization of a second pile wall with rock anchors okay some other structures i want to talk about at least the cross passage you see these this is the tunnel every now and then let us say at every 20 30 sorry uh, every 200 meters or 300 meters depending on which code you are using there is the national nfp that is the national fire protection code of america there is also now in our uh, bis uh, uh, code which is the nbc what you call in that they have introduced a chapter on metros and that also gives you the spacing of the uh, uh these um, cross passages why are cross passages required 
now when there is an accident or there is a emergency in one one uh, tunnel these cross passages allow the people to move into the other one that is the safety uh, in you, you don't have anything else you move from one it is not the possibility of both the things having fire and all that are not many so the uh, what you do is to have a cross passage every now and then so that the wherever you have the emergency the people can move to the safer side so this is all the protection level you have this also shows you uh, the plan and of course there is a um dewatering and all that whatever you want to do is here okay i think that some future concepts i want to tell you at the moment we are at 5.8 or 6 meter diameter single uh, train moving in one tunnel but in the future what is going to come we have already reached 5 and a half, uh, 15 and a half meter or so or 16 meters uh i mean worldwide i'm talking about and it is a multi mode tunnel that means that you have that the 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 road roadway you have the um the, the the metro you have ventilation ducts going here so all this is possible so in the future i'm sure that we are heading towards this one this is the famous washington dc iconic uh, uh, building and the the you can see what a fantastic uh, 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 impression it gives to the people who are standing here on the platform uh in delhi metro we are not far behind we are making for example all these murals on the sides of the wall so that people who come to the station they take pride on it and there is there is no need to write down no spitting allowed i mean the it it comes automatically people want to protect this environment this is something which i have taken from moscow which i had visited about 20 years ago and it was amazing the atmosphere in that underground station was very much like an airport i mean it was as a matter of fact better than an airport they take such pride in airports you may not find chandeliers but in metros in russia you can okay so that's the end of my presentation and thank you very much for your kind attention thank you professor tandan this was fascinating Uh, have another another sip of water before we start asking you questions. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> There are a few. <laughs> yes, I think it takes uh, more than six months before you are normal. Well, it looks like it. Can I ask a small question before yes, I go to the uh, question and answer box? Yeah, uh, you mentioned the uh, typical. Uh, contract to be 5 km long yeah and you mentioned some cost which i missed <coughs> 250 lakhs per meter oh, per meter you know like oh, something which is above ground maybe only 1 lakh per meter a maximum mm -hmm. cost yeah but when you go down it is 2 and 1/2 times the cost right uh, that that brings me to another uh, uh, clarification i want to seek Uh, is much of the metro development in our country right now uh, overground or underground you see because there are there the, are issues both sides looking at the costs everybody would like to go above the ground because people don't have that much money but right. now you, you know the problem with the uh, the elevated thing is that you are spoiling the skyline forever because the design life is 100 years or 120 years which you are yes. designing these structures for and uh, so there is no chance in our lifetime or our children's lifetime perhaps 
that that thing is going to go away people are trying to improve the skyline the sustainability and if you go overhead you are not really looking after that so the right thing to do make everything underground but obviously where there is not much traffic where you have to long distance between uh, stations you can yes. think of overground so it's a is the way you look at life and the quality of life yeah. okay yeah that that because there are problems overground as well as underground so and the underground is costlier but as you said about the skyline and so on uh, people might prefer to go underground okay can i now look at some questions um Uh, Mr. Rohit Kumar is asking, what shall be the construction stages for cut and cover station with temporary strut uh, whaler for top-down methodology? I, I guess you've touched upon it, but if you'd like to add anything. No, I think that the top-down construction is much cheaper and uh, it is more suited to our country. Uh, the bottom up means that you have to dig up the whole th uh, you know the the whole excavated thing and start from the bottom which is obviously a more expensive thing to do so both i mean uh, you can have any uh, both the types of constructions are possible top down means that you have to do the roof first then you go to the next slab uh, i mean after excavation below the roof slab you go to the next level then you excavate below this what I may call the concourse level, you go below that. So you are excavating in stages and disposing of that soil, which is a subject by itself, how, where to dispose it of. But a large amount of soil, of course, is being excavated. But this, it's pretty straightforward, the, uh, the top down. And bottom up, obviously, is straightforward because you dug a hole and from there you are starting the construction at the bottom and coming up free from the uh, sides. Okay, another one from Mr. Likon Biswas. Although you have again touched upon this issue. Uh, he says, please explain the reason of seepage of the tunnel at Bau Bazaar in between Shalda to Esplanade, East-West Metro, Calcutta, which causes failure of buildings nearby. Why such failure? in same location is noticed three times during construction of tunnel. I think it's a pretty, I mean, the question is obvious. The um, seepage of water, when he says, is it into the tunnel? Is that what he's meaning? Or is he meaning the lowering of the water level, which is affecting the buildings which are close by? I suppose he's uh, saying that uh, why is it happening that you know buildings nearby are affected repeatedly? Are affected. You see, the, 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 uh, obviously, you know, you extract anything, a soil, and you make a tunnel or you are making a diaphragm wall next to, the, uh, next to a building. Nothing is infinitely rigid in this world. So uh, it is going to deform. And in that deformation, you are going to get settlements either at the top or on the sides. So if your building is within that range, uh, you have to check whether this can take it or not. We have gone, as a matter of fact, close to uh, less than a meter from a 100-year-old building. In Bombay, if you go to places like Kalba Devi and things like that, uh, buildings are more than 100 years old. Forget about drawings. People don't even know what material they are made of. So then you have to strengthen the building, uh, put uh, temporary columns, etc., to make sure that the structure remains stable. Uh, because we can't afford the th thing to come down. Sometimes, in rare cases, where you have some kind of a danger, you are expecting and you are not sure, you ask the building to be vacated. And it is a part of the contract normally that the, the people who are living in that building will be given an accommodation for the time that you are asking them to vacate. 
because the cost of something collapsing is much greater than putting up putting these people up in hotels or whatever i remember there was this uh, close to our uh, khan market where we have the ambassador hotel and you have a lot of government uh, uh, buildings just close by all the entire buildings uh, what, what had to be vacated and one night we all met at 2 o'clock in the morning and <laughs> brainstorming as to what to do next because the the the, that, the diaphragm wall not the diaphragm wall but the, the the walls that we had constructed were made from what is called soldier pile and panels that is one more uh, method of making the wall it is cheap but you should never do it when the water table is high because these uh, panels that you put between which are making up the wall those are you know that's where water leaks from the joints and uh, once the water starts leaking from there and you are constructing these anything that is very close you are going to get into trouble so we met there we decided that all the building must be vacated there are about two three buildings close by and people will be put up at ambassador hotel because this is a government accommodation there are all government officers staying there but that is what has to be done so that is the way to do it and i think that it is a good thing that this is always a part of the contract that any kind of a thing that you do they have given you what you can do or cannot do but even beyond that you are supposed to be the experts if if the metro people had all the expertise they would not appoint you or appoint the consultants they would make it themselves so it says yes. <laughs> okay uh, mr mukul goel is asking the pipeline you mentioned in mumbai seems to be supported by roof slab but how was it supported before casting of roof slab yes you know there are many ways of doing it the uh, we have even got cases both in bombay and delhi where the uh, the pipelines such as those that you saw were even made a part of the station which means that not inside the station but the the slab was made in a folded kind of a fashion so that it remains outside the station but it is accommodated within the um uh, within the depth of the uh, whatever you are constructing so uh, it's uh, I, i mean you can you know the obvious way in which it can be done is you put a lot of saddles which support the pipe at frequent intervals and these saddles are connected to transverse members which are supported independently so while you are digging below the 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 um the pipelines are not st- staying uh, they are staying where they are but not supported on the ground they are hung from by putting these uh, cradles that i mentioned so there are many yeah. techniques available uh, like this right. uh, then we have a question from mr achit ghosh more comment than question uh, Yes, the TBM works in positive pressure to reduce chances of soil collapse. Workers can work for a limited time in this higher pressure. They are to be conditioned and deconditioned for working. Uh, Professor Tandon may like to comment. You see, I am not an expert at what is called the uh, safety uh, aspects of this there are many many issues of safety of personnel which is uh, which comes into the picture and uh, all those people firstly have to be well trained even how to wear a vest is a is a training session by itself and they have to be looked after if it requires um, you know conditioning like you are going the the atmospheric pressure is going to be higher than uh, where they are about to reach and they may have to reach sometimes very close to the cutter head in the front 
that little chamber that is there where soil actually it is meant for the soil, you may actually have to send people there. So in that type of a situation, yeah, sure, it has the person has to be conditioned, but not the people who are working, uh, you know, uh, behind. In those type of special situations where uh, you are likely to uh, move somebody into that chamber, you 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 condition that person. Yeah. The other thing he's saying is, uh, by the way, mechanical engineers are not only required for HVAC. Uh, what about the TBM itself? You see, TBM is such a complicated and sophisticated <laughs> machine, as you could see. I mean, that one machine can do what all? I mean, it's not only boring a horizontal hole in the ground at uh, 20 uh -huh. meters deep, it is also putting <laughs> the, 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 the lining, which is the precast panels, which are just brought there and this thing picks it up and puts it all over the place. So the build, the TBMs are becoming so sophisticated every day. In the first project that we did, it was done by a crane, by, by a, what is it called? A, a traveling gantry. All the, 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 um, uh, this uh, making of the lining. Now, less and less so. So, mechanical engineering is so important, but I was talking about the mechanical engineering that is required in the permanent structure, not in the temporary works. Of course, in the temporary works, it's a, a huge, huge, there are experts of, of the machine who come along. I mean, you, you don't can't just take their machine, you have to take their people also. Because if it gets yeah. stuck somewhere, <laughs> or something like yeah. that, or something goes wrong with it, our, we will not <laughs> even know. We'll be uh, as bad as we are in projecting a, what is that, sharing a, uh, sharing a, a presentation on Zoom. That is how we will be if something goes wrong in the machine. So you have to have people from the, sure. Uh, sure. you know, the mechanical manufacturer. And well. They are all mechanical yeah. engineers. Uh, by, by the way, Mr. Achit Kosh is a mechanical engineer, so... Yes, you know, yes. Uh, I, I don't know why he's asking that question. <laughs> they are certainly extremely important. Very important. Okay, I go to the next one. Abhishek Singh wants to know, where should we use NATM and where TBM? What is costlier? NATM is obviously more costly. Uh, and it is something which is very slow. And... You have to make a temporary um, kind of a surfacing first, which is made by uh, by uh, making a umbrella, let us say, of pipes. That's the uh, best way to do it. And then you dig from inside. That is how the uh, NATM is done. And it is, like I said, more costly, slower, more chances of problems than a TBM, which has now become more or less uh, mechanical. Uh, next two questions may be somewhat connected. Uh, how construction is done through groundwater and also especially in rainy season? And then um, how are we taking into account of the increase in water table, if any, in future? And also the overburden pressure of flood, if any, in future? You see, you have to know your groundwater table. There are a lot of things available in the, on the, uh, by the groundwater table, uh, groundwater board, as they call it in every major city. And uh, you have to find out during the course of this uh, construction, what is going to be the water table and the highest water table. And you have to work with that. When you are in a city like Bombay, it is practically at the ground level. So there's no question of uh, any relief in that. So the groundwater table, both for design and for construction purposes, you have to take it at the ground level. And it the even at the ground level, the there may be water logging, which is even worse. I mean, and in all these big cities, we have these big water logging problems also, as you can notice. So those are the pressures which you will have, uh, which you have to deal with. Uh, and of course, the tunnel boring machines 
or it, you have to know where you are going to make the tunnel and there are specialist boring machines suitable to a particular situation. Like if you have a rock, the same tunnel boring machine which you have for soft soil will not work. The, the, if you put that type of a machine, the cutter head will get spoiled in, by the time you move four meters or five meters, it will be finished. You will have to change the whole cutter head, which is a very expensive part of the whole machine. So it's uh, how much pressure you have to deal with because these are earth pressure balancing uh, machines. So you can make sure that you have enough pressure inside, then nothing comes inside, no water at least. And of course, no, no, no earth should come, no water should come. That is what we try to do. Um, so that's a part of the, you know, the, the whole technology of construction with a tunnel boring machine that you have to do. I mean, it's comparatively simpler to do it, to do what we are doing with the uh, underground stations, uh, how to prevent that. I mean, that means that you have to make sure about the water table and how to, um, how to, how to take account of the difference of water table. It's a question of more pressure or less pressure on the walls with the perimeter wall once you make. It's a matter of, you know, structural engineering, how to, they know how to calculate it. But it's more complicated in a mechanical equipment. Okay. Uh, how the waterproofing arrangement made to last forever? Can it be made to last forever? Uh, you know, I... No, as a matter of fact, these days what is happening is that we are uh, using um, some fibers and uh, specialist uh, compounds, chemical compounds to make the, uh, the structure waterproof. In the old days, we never allowed this. But now I think it is people are coming back to the idea that perhaps it can be done. The, 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 uh, the structure can be made watertight if you have proper admixtures and uh, fibers in it. So that is what is being done at the, at the moment. Okay. Uh, where should we use bottoms up and where top <laughs> down? Uh, bottoms <laughs> up is in drinks and you, you know you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're doing bottoms up next. Uh, I'd like to be present. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the question is, uh, what is the permissible settlement of sheet pile at top? Sheet pile? Hmm. I think that all these uh, piles, uh, what, not sheet pile, sheet pile is also a, to make a wall. So it's a question of not so much the, the vertical settlement, but it's a question of how much movement it will have a perpendicular to the wall, which is permitted. So even a sheet pile wall, you have to find out what are the pressures that are going to come and uh, what will be the deflections and what is permissible. I told you the moment that there is nothing infinitely rigid, even a concrete wall deflects. And if you make it in, sh in uh, a sheet pile wall, probably it will deflect a little more. So in all those cases, that void that is created and the soil which occupies that space, that is what is causes problems as far as settlement of the ground is concerned uh, in, the, in the nearby. So once you know how to deal with it, at least you know the problem. Uh, next question is very interesting. There is a tube. Uh, where, is it? where have I lost it? Yeah. There is a tube between London and France inside the sea. Yes. So, so what would be the difference in the construction or design practice compared to ground? I think that it is much more complicated. And why talk about London? Even in the uh, Calcutta Metro, uh, you have something which is going under the under that lake, which is about I think four kilometers long, if I remember correctly. And that's, uh, I mean, it's it's a special technique which they adopt to keep the water out. Uh, because in no way you can get the water in when you are constructing. So it's 
more complicated, but it is being done. Yeah. Um, next is, uh, can you please brief us to estimate seismic forces on underground structures <laughs> also? Well, yeah. well, well. <laughs> seismic forces, it's true that it is different from what we have uh, you know, on the um, in above ground structures. Here, what happens is that you assume that the soil moves, and along with it, the the whatever is buried inside, it also moves with it. So there is no uh, inertial force that you have to take into account, but. The thing is that when the earth is shaking and moving, what is available as the, what we call the free field movement, uh, I don't know whether, free field means that supposing there was nothing, you just have the earth uh, ground and uh, you have an earthquake on it and you assume that that earthquake starts from some distance below the ground. Now, when you come to the ground level, or before you reach the ground level, you are going to encounter your station or your um, uh, tunnel. So station is the more complicated one because it's a huge structure which is moving along with the uh, soil. So no inertial force to be taken. But since the distance between the two, that means the bottom of the station and the top of the station, the free field movement which we have uh, to take is different. So this whole, what is going to be, a, what was a rectangular box becomes a rectangular box. So it is not the inertial uh, force that you have to worry, worry about. You have to worry about the deformations. So it is really deformation based that uh, you decide uh, what are the bending moments and shear forces during an earthquake in a situation like that. As far as the tunnel is concerned, fortunately, at least whatever we are doing in India is small in diameter. And that also can overlies depending on, uh, you know, where the, which side the, uh, the movement comes from. But these are all manageable and they are not so complicated. The this station is more complicated, definitely, because you have to do a free field analysis first to find out what are the differences in the movement of the soil. And then you assume that it is the this and anything that is buried underground moves the same way. So as a matter of fact, in pipelines and all that, they don't take, uh, uh, they don't even consider the uh, anything other than, you know, the joints, etc., where you can have relative movement along the alignment of the soil that is what uh, it is uh, that is what is catered for there is no inertial force that you have to worry about okay uh, i see mr bhamik has his hand up ha ah, uh, yes please. yeah thank you so i have uh, one observation and two questions uh, firstly i think uh, a fascinating presentation, extremely enlightening, very, very informative. And uh, I was just wondering how you can cover such a huge subject in such, such a simple manner in, you know, one and a half hours. Uh, it is really an eye opener. I mean, I think you have covered the entire gamut of underground uh, uh, metro. Uh, questions uh, number one. I think uh, Professor Prem Krishna touched upon in his opening remarks, but I still would like to go a little deeper. How in India the decision is taken as to what part should be underground and what part should be elevated? Is it that by default elevated and where not possible go for underground? Or is it by default underground where, you know, underground is costly? Uh, elevated. How how it is decided in India? Okay. So the most important uh, thing that decides is that everybody will want to go 
above ground because the money is scarce. But it depends on how much noise the people living in that area can make, and how many cases are put on the <laughs> and pressure is put by the court, or rather by going to the court, that this is something which is not acceptable to us. Those are the things which finally govern. But where people are, you know, silent and all that. Uh, I mean, the municipality or whoever is there, I mean, they would like to do it at the least cost. They have other things, other uses of the money, which you are saying that, oh, it will spoil the skyline. And, uh, they are not bothered about skyline. They are not bothered about sustainability. Then, of course, you go above ground. But that is what is happening in India. I mean, if yeah. you look at a place like Singapore, Whatever was above ground, they are now making it underground. Making it underground, yeah. So I mean, that is the that is the global trend to yes, go underground trend. from environmental considerations. Absolutely. But uh, you see, where you mentioned about the cost of something like two two twenty five lakhs per meter, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but I believe that that cost is also uh, not uh, kind of uniform everywhere. For example, in Mumbai. The cost must be much higher than the figure you mentioned because of the land cost and because of the underground uh, rocky strata. Uh, any 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 comment on that? I mean, is it uniform yes. all through or no? No, no, it it's very... not uniform. Mm -hmm. It is widely varying, but like all engineers, I just wanted to give a thumb rule. Okay, okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it is varies, of course. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, Many contractors have gone um, broke, bankrupt, <laughs> bankrupt. <laughs> assuming something and then finding something else. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or in their anxiety to get the last <laughs> project in the world. That's how they, <laughs> they want to get that because after that, there are no more projects. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, so, one, one uh, last question, if yeah. you allow me. Sure. Yes, please. Uh, you see, uh, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning itself, that you know, uh, underground construction or design is a multidisciplinary activity yes. where you have, uh, you know, structural engineer, geotechnical engineer, you have this uh, ventilation, HVAC, mechanical, everything. Yeah. But uh, purely from the civil engineering perspective, I think uh, here is a case where uh, you know geotechnical engineer has almost the same or equal or if not more uh, important role to play as a structural engineer unlike you know a tall building or a bridge elevated structure where majorly it is the structural engineer and uh, uh, you know uh, geotechnical engineer takes a, a kind of a secondary role i would not belittle that but the prime or the team leader or the lead person is a structural engineer. Hmm. But in case of underground, uh, because it is a, a kind of an interprofessional practice, yes. who, who, according to you, what is the pre prevalent practice in India and uh, what is it, is it, what is the role of a geotechnical engineer normally that we have here? I will give you our own example. We don't try to mess around with uh, geotechnical we all, if we are make, uh, sort of working on an underground project where we are the prime consultants perhaps, but we have a joint venture partner who's equally important, uh, who's a ge pure geotechnical. So it's together that, you know, we have to sit down and uh, evolve the project and look after it as it as the construction goes on. Of course, after it is constructed, uh, the, the whole thing is disbanded. But we have been working on the underground things for the last, I don't know, couple of decades, always in collaboration with a, uh, a most of the time it's a joint venture. And that's the importance we give to the geotechnical part of it. And, you know, it is not just taking some boroughs and saying it's a SPT is so much. It's, just, it's much more than that. It's a, the geotechnical interpretation is so <coughs> complex. And, you know, if you make a mistake in that geotechnical, you can't make be too conservative. You can't be 
<laughs> on, on, on the unsafe side. So you are never sure. And, uh, and when you start digging, you find something totally different. That also happens. Like we found in one of the <clears throat> recent, which is under construction, you can't believe, at least I have never seen in my life, that there are, the, when you say, when we did the sub surface investigation, it shows a refusal. And refusal means that you, you have to, uh, you can't pile in that. It is that hard a rock. But when you actually excavate, what you find is something absolutely amazing. The it is the uh, like a one meter by three hundred millimeter by three hundred millimeter. These are the type of blocks of rock that you have, and of course inside. Uh, I mean, in the interspace, there is all uh, uh, mud or dirt, whatever you want to call it. Now, if you are going by the SPT value. Or even if you do a, uh, you know, a core in that, it will give you some idea. But when you go to the site, that's what I told people that, you know, you there is no use talking about this unless you go to the site and see. And of course, jokingly, I told our, the director of the project, you know, it is like somebody was trying to make the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pyramids. He started making the pyramids because that's how the stones look like. And then uh, he gave up and went to Egypt. And one of my colleagues, who's a geotechnical engineer, incidentally, he said that maybe they didn't pay him enough. <laughs> <laughs> His fees didn't come. So he went to <laughs> Egypt. So it's, uh, I mean, the ground has got so many surprises apart from the underground utilities. Most of them are uncharted. Nobody knows what it is, where it is. Only when you start digging, you realize that, uh, you know, it's not what you thought. Yeah. Thank you. I think underground well, underground you. works are much more challenging than the elevated much ones. More. Of course. <laughs> and costlier, of course. And costlier, of course. Yeah. Well, I... Uh, first of all, I second uh, Mr. Bhamik's remark. This has been a fascinating presentation. And it's amazing that in 90 minutes you can cover so much of ground about underground <laughs> metro stations. Yeah. Uh, there are bound to be questions, Gilbert. There are some more remaining. But I think uh, it's fair that we, uh, you know, complete this uh, uh, our program today. Uh, which has been on for about a couple of hours. And, uh, but before I do that, I will read a comment from Mr. Achyut Ghosh. Mr. Achyut Ghosh says, from bridges to buildings to underground tunnels, hats off to Professor Tandon. <laughs> yes. So with that, thank you again very much for this presentation, Professor Tandon, and I pass the uh, buck back to Dr. Dhawan. Uh, uh, as uh, Professor uh, and my friend uh, Bumik said, fascinating lecture. There are a few questions for me which I will ask him later. This is the time. Uh, so uh, now monthly thing, now next lecture, will be on 22nd of December at the same time, again by this uh, virtual board. And the speaker will be Vinay Gupta. And then uh, this thing will be informed in due course to everybody. And then I uh, encourage uh, the person to participate and share and gain knowledge from such experienced people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhawan. So, and th thanks to all the participants, you know, who've been with us. Thanks uh, to all of them. And wishing them well. Uh, let us then close this meeting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Mr. Achyut Ghosh. You have, 
unwittingly uh, told everybody how close friends we are with your remark but thank you 